good evening so we will discuss today the topic about liabilities of our intermediate accounting liabilities is one of the components of our statement of financial position formerly called balance sheet there is a need to reflect the true amount of liability on the part of the business on the management side we are duty bound to monitor our liabilities because liabilities are legal obligations meaning we are we are all compelled to pay or to settle our obligations on time or in accordance with the agreement the essence of accounting for liabilities is to reflect the true amount so that the readers may be benefited as to the true picture of the business as far as obligations are concerned on the part of management proper reporting of liabilities is necessary so that aside from monitoring management can assess and can do some strategies on how to manage our indebtedness so let's proceed with the next uh, with the first slide of this presentation So let's define liabilities. Liabilities are present obligations of an entity to transfer an economic resource as a result of past events. So these are present obligations of an organization. When we say obligations, we have an existing law that govern our obligations to our fellow human beings we have an obligations so liabilities are obligations you have an obligation to settle as agreed upon so that settlement will affect transfer of an economic result as a result of past events economic resources transfer of economic resources that transfer of economic resources refers to the settlement of our liabilities so obligations refer to legal or constructive obligations which means if you will not fulfill said obligations you may incur an additional liability which is the legal liability so the situation will be worse if you will not settle your obligations because there is an agreement the agreement may either be in writing or verbally whatever is the form of your agreement you have to comply and your failure to comply may incur an additional liability another liability and that is your legal liability the person to whom you have indebtedness 
may run after you in court to pursue that case against you because of your failure to settle your obligations and whatever case in court that may be settled is a legal liability aside from that legal liability <coughs> a company may be exposed to a possible loss of reputation and this is another an added insult to the injury when you will not comply with the settlement of your obligations loss of reputation is greater than or uh, has more severe than legal liability legal liability may be settled but the loss of reputation may be a lifetime loss that is the reason why we have to monitor our liabilities because of that obligation whether legal or constructive obligation the transfer of economic resource here pertains to the payment of the obligation which may be in the form of cash or in kind so once you settle your obligations whatever is the form of payment your obligations will be extinguished or eliminated if you have money the better if you have your property that may be acceptable as settlement for your obligation and that is what we meant by transfer of economic resource these obligations are the results of past events meaning results of past business transactions we are in the business we are we have certain business activities in some instances or in most instances we need to achieve our objective we need those activities so that we can attain our business objectives if we do not have enough money to finance those activities to achieve our business objectives we have no choice but to borrow money and that borrowings is the result of business transactions so you incur liabilities because you want to achieve something which is related to the advocacy of your business that is why in business we cannot avoid liabilities because we have so much business activities time may come that because of too much activities we are running out of fund and we cannot postpone those activities that is why we have to incur liabilities these are the things to consider regarding liabilities cash dividend payable is an accounting liability because the corporation who declared dividend ought to pay their shareholders for cash so this is just a review of our accounting for corporations wherein the corporation declared dividends which will be distributed to all shareholders once the corporation declared dividends they are creating a liability liability to pay shareholders for cash that obligation is a legal obligation because there is an agreement between the corporation and the shareholders that they will pay them dividends and it will be part of the total company's liabilities dividend payable is part of the liability so let's have the entry for the dividends 
when you declare dividends you will prepare an entry debit retained earnings because you will get the dividends from your accumulated earnings retained earnings is part of the shareholders equity retained earnings represent the accumulated earnings of the company in the previous or the past years that is why when the corporation declared dividend the entry is debit retained earnings because you will reduce your retained earnings retained earnings is part of shareholders equity part of the capital the normal balance is credit that is why when you declared dividend you will debit retained earnings and credit cash dividends payable that cash dividend payable is our liability to whom to the shareholders upon payment to the shareholders you will reverse you will debit cash dividends payable and credit cash the cash will now be distributed to all shareholders so this is how we illustrate one of the liabilities that will appear in our balance sheet that is cash dividends payable If the corporation declares share dividends, there will be no accounting liability because share dividends distributable is part of the shareholders equity. Share dividends instead of distributing cash to the shareholders the corporation may declare share dividends otherwise known as stock dividends these are also to be distributed but the amount that will be distributed is not in the form of cash but in the form of shares of stocks meaning added ownership on the part of the existing shareholders but share dividends to be distributed is not an accounting liability it is part of the shareholders equity meaning an addition to the total shareholders equity I will repeat this is not considered an accounting liability meaning not part of the total liabilities in the statement of financial position but rather part of the shareholders equity as an addition so what is the entry when the company declared share dividends or stock dividends debit again retained earnings because share dividends will be taken from the accumulated earnings of the corporation and credit share dividends distributable meaning these shares of uh, uh, stocks are subject to distribution to the shareholders upon distribution what is the entry debit share dividends distributable and credit share capital so you may notice here cash is not involved upon distribution of share dividends the entry is debit share dividends distributable and credit share capital next how will you measure your liabilities when you say measurement just like in the assets you will express the amount of your liabilities in terms of peso so how will you measure our liabilities initial measurement the basis is the face value this is mostly applicable to current liabilities 
But there is a subsequent measurement. The subsequent measurement is based on amortized cost. Subsequent measurement is applicable to non-current liabilities. It is not applicable to current liabilities. Why? Because current liabilities will be immediately settled within the current year. So there is no amortized cost. Whereas in long-term liabilities or non-current liabilities, there is a subsequent measurement which is usually being done at the end of the year or at the end of any accounting period. So, subsequent measurement which is amortized cost is applicable to non-current liabilities. What is amortized cost? Let's have an example. Amortized cost is mostly applicable to bonds payable. <clears throat> Everybody is familiar with bonds payable. If the corporation needs funds and they do not want to issue shares of stocks, they would rather issue bonds payable to the public with interest rate. The investors will be given interest as a return for their investments. As compared to stocks, the bondholders are not owners but rather creditors of the corporation. So let's have an example. If a company issued bonds with an issue price or market price of 97,000 and having face amount of 100,000 pesos. Let's analyze that statement, that sentence. The face amount of the bonds issued by the company is 100,000 pesos, meaning to say that is the amount, the total amount written in bonds, in the certificate of bonds. But it was sold in the market at 97,000 pesos only. <coughs> the interest rate is 4% per annum. The interest rate of 4% is the one written on the face of the bonds. Just like 100,000 pesos, it is written on the face of the bonds. The interest rate of 4% per annum is also written on the face of the bond. But the market interest rate, meaning to say the interest rate on bonds being offered in the market is 7% higher than the interest rate written on the face of the bond. If you are an investor, will you put your money in a bond with only 4% interest whereas some other companies are offering 7%? Are you willing to put your money in that bond with 4% as against the market interest rate of 7%? What will the company do so that their bonds will be sold to the market? They will sell the bonds at a lower price. Take note here. The face amount of the bonds is 100,000. But because of the lower interest of the bonds, they decided to lower the price at 97,000 pesos. So we have a difference of 3,000 pesos. You, we sold the bonds at a lower price because our interest rate is very low. Our interest rate is not competitive in the market. So we have a difference of 3,000 pesos. And the difference of 3,000 pesos is the discount which should be divided by the term of the bonds. In this case, the term of the bond is five years let's go back again to the problem the face amount of the bond which is written is 100,000 pesos but it was sold to 97,000 pesos to investor why? because the interest rate that we offer is only 4% 
whereas the interest rate in the market is 7%. If you are an investor, will you acquire a bond with 4%? You would rather put your money in another bond offering 7% interest. But since the company wants to dispose the bond, they decided to sell it at a lower price of 97,000 pesos. So we have a difference of 3,000 which is labeled as discount. That 3,000 discount is subject to amortization. So if the term of the bond is 5 years, the amount of 3,000 discount should be divided by 5 to arrive at an annual amortization. We can fully understand this problem by looking at the journal entries which are presented in the next slide. So let's take a look at the journal entries. So what is the entry on the issuance of bonds? Remember, the face amount of our bonds is 100,000 pesos. Since our interest rate is only 4%, as compared to the market interest rate of 7%, we decided to lower the price of the bonds at 97,000 pesos. So what is the entry? Debit cash, 97,000 pesos. This is the amount that we receive from the investor because the investor doesn't want to buy our bonds at 100,000 pesos because of our lower interest. So the investor paid only 97,000 pesos. That is the amount that we receive. So debit, cash, and debit. Discount on bonds payable of 3,000. That is the difference within, between 100,000 pesos and 97,000. And that difference is discount on bonds payable and credit bonds payable of 100,000 pesos. So here we can see how we treat the discount. Again, I will repeat, the face value of our bonds is 100,000 pesos. That is the amount written on the bond certificate itself. But we sold our bonds at 97,000 pesos. Why? Because our interest rate is only 4% as compared to the existing interest rate in the market of 7%. So we are willing to sacrifice at a lower price. And the difference between the two is 3,000 pesos and we labeled it as discount on bonds payable. So that is the entry on the date of issuance of bonds. So what is the entry on the date of interest payment and amortization of discount? Let's assume that interest payment on these bonds is being done on an annual basis at the same time upon payment of interest we will amortize the discount on bonds payable what do you mean by amortization of discount amortization means we will reduce the discount gradually just like your depreciation we will reduce 3000 gradually based on the term of the bond in this case the term of the bond is 5 years. So what is the entry when we pay our investor interest payment? Simultaneously, we will prepare an entry for the amortization of discount on bonds payable of 3,000 pesos. So the entry is debit interest expense 4,600 pesos. We will discuss later how we got the 4,600 pesos interest expense. So, credit, discount on bonds payable, 600 pesos. Why? Because the amount of our discount on bonds payable is 3,000. We will amortize it, meaning we will reduce it gradually until it became zero. So the term is 5 years, 3,000 divided by 5 years, that is 600 pesos. Take a look, we credited discount on bonds payable because we will reduce it gradually until it reach the maturity date 
after 5 years. That is why discount on bonds payable is credited at 600 pesos and credit cash because we paid the investor. And the computation of interest is based on what has been written on the face of the bond of 4%. 4% multiplied by 100,000 pesos that is 4,000 pesos that is why our interest expense is 4,600 pesos again the entry is debit interest expense 4,600 pesos credit discount on bonds payable 600 pesos that entry represents amortization of bond discount and credit cash, 4,000 pesos, the interest that we paid to the bond holder or investor. <clears throat> so, discount on bonds payable is a contra liability account. Bonds payable is a liability. It is a long-term liability because the term is five years. If you will present bonds payable as a long-term liability, you will deduct discount on bonds payable so that you can arrive at the amortized cost. And this is how you measure long-term liability like bonds payable. So, the bonds payable is 100,000 pesos. Whatever is the balance of discount of bonds pay, uh, discount on bonds payable, you will deduct that. You will arrive at the amortized cost of bonds payable. So, that is how we explain amortized cost of the liability. And that is how we present and treat discount on bonds payable so this the discount on bonds payable arises if the bonds are issued lower than the face amount next so here is the clear explanation bond discount or the discount on bonds payable is the amount by which the market price of a bond is lower than its principal amount due at maturity. Why lower? Because the interest rate is lower. No investor will buy your bond. So, the issuer has no choice but to lower the issue price of the bond just to dispose to the public. The bond is offered at a lower price because its interest rate or the interest rate on the face of the bond is lower than the current interest rates in the market. As I have said, the issuer has no choice. He is offering this interest while the market is offering a higher interest. Nobody wants to buy the bond. So the issuer of the bond has no choice but to lower the market price. And that is why bond discount arises. What do you mean by premium on bonds or bond premium? Premium on bonds arises when the market price is above the face amount. The bond might trade at a premium because its interest rate or the interest rate on the face of the bond is higher than the current interest rate in the market. How can you explain this? Supposing the interest rate written on the bond certificate is 7% while the interest rate being offered in the market is only 4%. Investors will run after you, the issuer of the bonds, because they knew that you are offering a higher interest. In that case, what will you do? Because of the law of supply and demand, you will increase the market price of your bond because you are offering a higher interest. In that case, premium on bonds arises. Next. 
So let's have an example so that we can fully understand how band premium or premium on bonds took place. Athena Company issued bonds with face amount of 100,000 having an interest rate of 7%. Take note. The face value of the bond is 100,000. That is the amount written on the bond certificate itself. And the interest rate being offered by Athena is 7%. 7% is the interest rate written on the face of the bond. The market interest rate is 4% if you are an investor. Some companies are offering 4% interest rate on their bonds while Athena is offering 7%. You will rather choose bonds issued by Athena because of that 7%. If Athena will tell you, no, I will not give my bonds to you at 100,000. I will sell it at a higher price. Are you willing to pay higher price? If you are willing to pay, there will be a bond premium. So in this example, there is a bond premium because investors are willing to pay higher than 100,000 pesos just to acquire the bonds of Athena and the term of this bond is 5 years question number 1 what is the entry to record the issuance of bonds here we can understand how we treat bond premium or premium on bonds payable question number 2 what is the entry to record the payment of annual interest? So in the, in the payment of annual interest, we will also record amortization of bond premium. Just like discount on bonds payable, bond premium is also subject to amortization computed based on the term of the bond. So let's answer question number one. What is the entry to record the issuance of bonds? <clears throat> Since we sold bonds, we will receive cash from the investor. Debit cash, 103,000 pesos. Take note. Since the investors are willing to pay higher than 100,000 pesos, they paid 103,000 pesos. This is the usual computation. There is no hard and fast rule as far as the premium is concerned. But generally, some companies are computing the premium based on the difference between the interest rate of the bonds and the interest rate in the market. The interest rate of this bond by Athena Company is 7%. The interest rate existing in the market is 4%. 7 minus 4 is 3%. Multiplied by 100,000, that is 3,000 pesos. Plus 100,000, the face value of the bond. So, the issue price is 103,000 pesos. So, the cash that we receive from the investor is 103,000 pesos. As against the face amount of the bond of 100,000 pesos. The investor is willing to pay an amount higher than 100,000 pesos because the interest rate being offered by Athena is 7%. 3% higher than the 4% being offered by other companies. So the entry, debit cash, 103,000 pesos, the amount that we receive from the investors. Credit premium on bonds payable, 3,000 pesos, the difference between 103,000 pesos and 100,000 pesos face value of the bond. And of course, credit bonds payable of 100,000 pesos. So by means of this entry, we can have a clear picture of what we meant by premium on bonds payable. Here we can see that the investor 
paid an amount higher than the face value of the bond. As a result, premium on bonds payable is created. Next, let's answer question number two. What is the entry to record the payment of annual interest and amortization of bond premium? So, debit interest expense 6,400 pesos. Where did we get 6,400? We will only determine how we arrive at that amount by means of the succeeding accounts title in the entry. Debit premium on bonds payable, that is 600 pesos. Because the amount of premium is 3,000 pesos divided by the term of the bond of 5 years, 600, you may notice premium on bonds payable is debited because we will reduce the premium gradually every year until it's zero out on the fifth year. The normal balance of premium on bonds payable is credit. That is why we debited the amount of 600 to reduce it gradually. And credit cash of 7,000 pesos, that is the amount of interest given to the investor. So here we can see clearly how we treat and how we amortize premium on bonds payable. Premium on bonds payable is a liability account and should be added to the cost of the bond. If you will prepare balance sheet or statement of financial position, premium on bonds payable is part or will be added to the bonds payable. It is a liability. As compared to discount on bonds payable, discount on bonds payable is a contra liability account being deducted from the face amount of the bonds payable. So let's leave bonds payable. Let's proceed to covenants. Covenants are often attached to the borrowing agreements which represents undertakings by the borrower. What do you mean by covenants? It is an agreement. It is a promise. It is a pledge. If there is a covenant in borrowing, the borrower promised something aside from the promise to pay. Covenants are undertakings. When you say undertakings, these are the things to be done in relation to the borrowed money or borrowed amount. So that is undertaking. You have to do something aside from the payment of the loan. So in this case, if there is a covenant, the borrower will accomplish additional document. The first document, of course, is the promissory note. That is the promise to pay. The second document is the deed of undertaking. The deed of undertaking is the covenant. Undertaking to do something aside from the payment of the loan. So an undertaking means you promise to do something which is legally binding. You borrowed money, you promise to pay, aside from promise to pay, you have to do something to the satisfaction of the lender. Non-fulfillment of such promise would result to consequences. What are those consequences? If you will not fulfill with your promise to do something and that is the covenant that will result to some negative effect 
or negative consequences. So let's have one specific example. A Tina company borrowed money from BPI amounting to 3 million pesos. The company used its land and building as collateral to the loan. So this is a very typical transaction. BPI lend money to Athena, 3 million. BPI ask for a collateral. And that is the land and building property of Athena registered under the name of Athena. In case of non-payment, BPI will take land and building to satisfy the amount of the loan. So Athena executed an undertaking. Take note of this undertaking. This is now the covenant. Athena executed an undertaking that no part of its building will be rented to anybody. Hence, no occupants will be allowed. Take note, that is the covenant of Athena to BPI. So, BPI to make sure that the property will be uh, considered security to the loan, no part of its building should be rented. No occupants will be allowed. Only Athena company will occupy the building. That is the covenant of Athena to BPI. Athena is not supposed to break that promise. Athena is not supposed to violate that undertaking or the covenant to BPI. Nobody is allowed to occupy the building as lessee or the one renting the property. That is the promise of Athena. Why? Why is BPI requiring this type of covenant? Because in case of non-payment, BPI will confiscate the property, the land and building. If there are tenants inside the building, it is very difficult for BPI to eject those tenants. Because those tenants signed a lease agreement to Athena. That is the reason why BPI issued that undertaking to Athena. And Athena confirmed with that covenant so let's now discuss breach or violation of covenant when you say breach that means you violated the agreement in law you, you always heard the term breach of contract that is a violation of the contract so breach or violation of covenant is synonymous with the breach of contract because that covenant is also a contract. So let's discuss breach or violation of covenant. If the covenants are not fulfilled, the liability will become on demand. Hence, classified as current. Take note. Let's go back to our example. Example of Athena. Athena borrowed money from BPI. So there is a covenant that the land and building used as collateral are not supposed to be occupied by other persons. If Athena violated that covenant, the loan to BPI will become a current liability. Because most of the time, when you borrowed money to the bank, that is a long-term liability. So in this case, if Athena will violate the covenant, the liability to BPI will be classified as current. That is in accordance with our accounting standard. So let's read this. So this provision came from Philippine Accounting Standards number 1 paragraph 74 provides that such a liability is classified as current even if the lender has agreed after the reporting period and before the statements are authorized for issue not to demand 
payment as a consequence of the breach. What do you mean by this paragraph 74 of Philippine Accounting Standards number 1? Even if the lender has compassion, let's go back again to our example of Athena. Athena is the borrower. BPI is the lender. Athena violated the covenant. Athena allowed tenants in the building used as collateral. So there is a violation. According to the accounting standard, if there is a violation, the liability of Athena to BPI will immediately become current liability. Even BPI is not demanding for immediate payment. Even if BPI exercises compassion to Athena, BPI will not demand payment despite of the violation of the covenant according to the accounting standard that liability to BPI should be classified as current. It is very clear in the standard. The ruling is way above the compassion of the lender. Take note, there is a compassion on the part of BPI. Even if the lender agreed not to demand immediate settlement because of the violation of the agreement, the liability shall still be classified as current. In this case, if even if BPI is compassionate enough not to demand immediate payment that loan to BPI should be considered as current liability and that is clearly in accordance with paragraph 74 of Philippine Accounting Standards number 1 let's continue the breach or violation of covenant However, the liability is classified as non-current if the lender has agreed on or before the reporting period to provide a grace period ending at least 12 months after the date of the financial statements. What do you mean by grace period? Let's go back again to our example of Athena and BPI. Athena violated the covenant but BPI again is compassionate BPI gave a grace period of 12 months after the date of the financial statements if that is the case if BPI gave grace period the liability will be classified as non-current that is very clear. What do you mean by grace period? Grace period is the period of compassion. Period of mercy. Because BPI is compassionate to Athena. When you become an employee. Example. When I was an employee of that one commercial bank in our country. Our official time in is 8.30 in the morning. If you will come after 8.30, technically speaking, you are late. But our company is giving a grace period of 15 minutes, meaning if you arrive at 8.45, you are not still considered late because there is a period of 15 minutes and that 15 minutes is called grace period because our company gave compassion, gave allowance for the traffic congestion that we may experience. So grace period is the period of compassion, period of mercy. And that period in this provision of the standard, if the lender gave a grace period of 12 months, the liability will be classified as non-current. 
So grace period is the mercy and compassion on the part of the lender wherein they will not demand immediate payment despite the violation. If this grace period was provided by the lender in writing, hence the liability shall be considered as non-current. So, the grace period should be communicated by BPI to Athena in writing. BPI will inform Athena in writing that they will give a grace period of 12 months after the date of their financial statement. If that is the case, the accounting standards required that the liability should be considered as non-current liability. This ruling is applicable not only on the breach of the covenant but also on the breach of the entire loan agreement. What do I mean? You have two documents signed. Athena signed two documents. The promissory note and the deed of undertaking which is the covenant. Even if Athena did not violate the covenant but if Athena violated the promissory note meaning Athena is not paying on time this ruling shall be applicable the liability <coughs> shall be considered non-current provided a grace period is given by BPI what I am trying to emphasize here is that the breach or violation is not limited to covenant but also applicable to the payment on time which is clearly specified in the promissory note. So let's proceed to another topic, estimated liabilities. Estimated liabilities and obligations exist at the end of the reporting period although their amount is not definite the amount is not definite that is why we have to do an estimation because we do not know the exact amount in many cases the date when the obligation is due is not also definite and in some instances the exact payee cannot be identified or determined. Just imagine these estimated liabilities. You, you do not know the due date of the obligation. You do not know the due date of your obligation. And you do not even know the payee or the person in which you are indebted. You will make an estimation even though you do not know the payee. You do not know the due date. What are the examples? Examples are bonuses, vacation, health and pension benefits, and warranty liabilities. When you say bonuses, that is a liability. Actually, in this case, bonuses is not applicable to bonuses being given to the employees of the company we may give bonuses to our sales agent who meets the quota. We do not know if they will meet the quota this month. So, we do not know the exact amount of bonus that we are going to give them. That is why it is considered estimated liability. Another example, vacation. Vacation leave in some companies are being converted to cash. Most of the time, these are being given at the end of the year. But we do not know as of this moment who are those employees who will be given vacation converted to cash. That is why vacation is considered estimated liability. Health and pension benefits. Some companies provide 
health and pension benefits to their employees. But as of this moment, we do not know who among our employees will be hospitalized. We do not know who among the employees will avail of the retirement benefits. So we do not know the exact amount. That is why health and pension benefits are considered estimated liability. And the last example is warranty liabilities. So let's take an example. Let's have a scenario involving warranty liabilities. Monet Appliance Company sells electric pans and other major appliances to the public. Once a customer bought an appliance unit, a warranty certificate is given. The warranty usually covers a one-year period for repairs in case of some problems encountered in the product. The amount allotted as expense for the repairs as a result of the warranty is a warranty liability. This is based on estimate. I hope everybody is familiar with warranty. Whenever you purchase an appliance, an appliance unit in any appliance store, they will give you a certificate, a warranty certificate, in case that appliance unit that you purchase will not function as intended or you are not satisfied with it with its performance, you can go back to that store and ask them to do something because you are holding a warranty certificate. They will do something to remedy the situation. And the expense allotted for that warranty certificate is unknown to everybody. We can only determine the amount if the customer went back to the store and asked you to do something with the unit that they purchase. That is the reason why warranty certificate is considered an estimated liability. <clears throat> so here is the presentation of current liabilities in our statement of financial position. Under paragraph 54 of Philippine Accounting Standards number 1 as a minimum the base of the statement of financial position shall include the following li uh, line items for current liabilities. So current liabilities should be presented in this order. The first one, trade and other payables. Here we are referring to the payables related to the main business of the company. If your business is a merchandising business and frequently you are purchasing on account, we are referring to accounts payable. If, you're, if you executed a promissory note, that is notes payable and still related to trade, which is the main uh, focus of your business. Letter B, current provisions. You provided an allowance for certain losses and that is considered one of your liabilities. Short-term borrowing. You borrowed money from the bank and the term is within one year. Letter D, current portion of short-term debt. That is considered a current liability and letter E current tax liability letter E usually pertains to the income tax payable of the company and other taxes payable to the Bureau of Internal Revenue
so we will continue our discussion uh, on our next session that is about uh, long term liabilities uh, long term liabilities entails a lot of discussion illustration and explanation so I hope everybody are still safe as of this moment and hope to see you soon in our regular classroom discussion thank you very much everybody and good evening